This is a brief overview of the U.S. Air Force Academy's pandemic math modeling team, key efforts and conclusions. We are happy to provide more detail to anyone who is interested. The Air Force Academy plans to have all 4,000 plus cadets back on campus for the fall semester. To safely do so, given the threat of COVID-19, we have developed a strategy based on random pooled testing of our cadet and faculty population. The level of testing that we plan to do is based on a solution to what we call the fizzle equation. The fizzle equation ensures that any nascent outbreak of COVID-19 is caught and arrested before it actually has a chance to become a full-fledged outbreak. Although our strategy was developed in the context of the Air Force Academy, it is more widely applicable to other universities and DOD mission elements as well. On the basis of the fizzle equation, we estimate that we'll need to do roughly 15% random testing on a weekly basis, so approximately 750 tests every week. For logistics and practical efficiency reasons, we plan to do that testing through pooled assays using the in-house capabilities of our world-class biology department. The pandemic math team was chartered to answer two key questions posed by our superintendent. One, what size of cadet population can we safely bring back for the fall semester? And second, what level of testing would be needed to ensure the safety of our cadets, faculty, and staff? The pandemic math team is a multidisciplinary team consisting of PhDs in microbiology, virology, statistics, data science, mathematical modeling, and public health professionals. And we've been able to answer both of the two big policy questions, as well as begin to look at other questions regarding policy options and overall risk. Our key result is a closed form equation for how much testing is required to keep a nascent out epidemic outbreak from actually becoming a full outbreak. We call it the fizzle equation. We simulate our approach to the fall semester under a wide range of conditions using two computer models. The first computer model is a US Air Force Academy developed agent-based Monte Carlo simulation that essentially follows a day in the life of a cadet. They wake up, they have a roommate, they go to class, they play sports after school. The second model is an SCIR model that runs over a stochastic network. It was developed by University of Washington grad student Ryan McGee, one of Car Professor Carl Bergstrom's computational biology PhD candidate, and that model is available on GitHub. Actually, both the Monte Carlo and SCR models are available on GitHub, and they both have similar aspects that permit us to change the size of an initial outbreak, look at the effects of outbreaks in the local community, the impact of different asymptomatic rates, and and as well as uh, estimates for expected quarantine and isolation loads that we may experience under different conditions and assumptions. We've done the V and V for both of our models on three outbreaks of convenience. The Theodore Roosevelt, Diamond Princess, and Charles de Gaulle were all close populations uh, of similar size to the U.S. Air Force Academy. We also have been able to look at our models over city and county outbreaks to, to show that they actually show dynamics that we would expect. Uh, and we've also validated our stochastic network on the basis of a November 2019 norovirus outbreak that we had at the Air Force Academy. Different virus, but, but same network. So uh, we have confidence in, uh, in, in the network dynamics. The fizzle equation that we develop is not dependent on these computer models. The fizzle equation is an independent solution of the underlying differential equations, but we can evaluate the efficacy of the fizzle equation using both of these computer models. We have done hundreds of thousands of runs by this point, probably more than a million for a wide range of parameters. For the results that we're gonna show in this presentation, uh, these are the best estimates for our 5,000 purse population at the US Air Force Academy. In R0 of 1.6, of course, we've looked at realistic ranges between 1.2 and 3.0. A 90% asymptomatic rate is based on the fact that four-fifths of our population is in the 18 to 22 year age cohort. And although the best 
current consensus for asymptomatic of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 is, is likely in the 40 to 65 percent range. 90 percent does represent a conservative worst case scenario for us. And it's also consistent with what we've seen among cadets that have been returning for summer programs. There are three types of testing uh, that we do. Uh, there are testings of symptomatic uh, cadets, cadets that show up with symptoms, cadets or faculty. Uh, there's the weekly random testing that we do. Uh, and again, on the basis of a, uh, the physical equation, we need to do that at about the 15% level. And then there's contact tracing, which will trace contacts of either those that are symptomatic or those that show up through the weekly random testing. Overall test effectiveness is, is given right here, uh, and we can uh, change the initial conditions to include different initial effective. Uh, we can introduce random introductions. So in this case, uh, every three weeks, there's three new exposed that are introduced. Uh, we can also model super spreader events. Uh, so here is a 25-person super spread event uh, that occurs just prior to uh, the 11th of October. This is what a typical simulation run looks like. We normally do this for 100 runs for a given set of conditions, and then we gather the statistics together into this periodic table looking thing that's, that summarizes the, the statistics. So as an example, we can look at uh, quarantine and isolation loads. Uh, we can look at the median, the 95th percentile, and the fifth percentile runs, as well as uh, how long it actually takes to, to achieve that. We can also model differential transmission between different population members. Uh, so for example, we can evaluate the attack rate of SARS-CoV-2 for cadets uh, who have more close contacts and more interactions uh, versus faculty members uh, who happen to be in a, a greater, greater proportion of our at-risk demographics. All of the statistics are, are summarized. Uh, one of the key components is uh, that contributes to the risk management is what is the probability and how many cases uh, out of 100 do the cases exceed uh, actually become an outbreak and we have arbitrarily defined an outbreak as uh, greater than 50 active cases and how often uh, out of those 100 runs does an outbreak remain under a peak infection of 25 active cases. In epidemiology, R0 is the basic reproductive number. And because it's a key element of the physical equation and underlies our test strategy, it is illustrative to walk through a basic example uh, to show what, what R0 is. So an R0 of 2.0 means that each infectious individual, so if we have an index case, uh, they with each generation of the disease, they will infect two more people. Uh, so after a single generation, there are, there are two infections and then four, and it grows exponentially. In this case, after three generations, uh, there's only seven active infections because uh, node 18 here uh, only had one additional person to, uh, that they could infect. Uh, and that is typical with typical outbreaks. Uh, every outbreak will eventually fizzle on its own when the population of susceptible individuals is exhausted. Now, you can, you can help accelerate that. Uh, if you can somehow remove a certain number of infections uh, from the population. So if you somehow remove only half of the new infections in each generation, the effective reproductive number is one. And after three generations, the, uh, there's nobody left here for node 18 to infect and, and the outbreak, the epidemic fizzles out. So the first step in a comprehensive pandemic strategy is to do the basic policy things that are straightforward. The emphasis on hygiene, the cleaning, the social spacing. SARS-CoV-2 in the wild uh, has an r not somewhere between 2 and 4.5. Uh, for environments with dense populations in which social distancing is difficult, so think the uh, aircraft carriers and the Diamond Princess cruise ship, um, it, it may be higher, and, and that bears out. Uh, in March, before we took the uh, the measures, uh, so here's 
two population centers, uh, the uh, estimates for the reproductive number, uh, New York City back in March and Seattle back in March. The CDC and their guidance to modelers uh, issue, uh, recommends a uh, R-naught between two and three uh, with a mean of 2.5, and that's before any additional policy uh, measures are taken. Just knowing that there's a virus and being aware and taking those upfront precautionary measures, those easy things that are to do, uh, has an effect. Uh, so hand washing and hygiene and masks, we can see, you know, in this case, it was actually after lockdowns were put in place in both New York City and Seattle. Uh, but you can see the reduction in the reproductive number uh, from what it was just a month earlier. So at the Air Force Academy, we can control things like how many cadets are sitting in a classroom, how many roommates they have, and the general mixing of the population. On an Air Force base, a wing commander can control uh, the work shifts or telework requirements uh, in order to reduce the density of folks in, in common areas. In both cases, we can mandate the basic hygiene and mask wearing that now appears to be very effective at reducing transmission uh, to a certain degree. At the Air Force Academy, we estimate that with 15% remote classes, so we will have the entire cadet population back, uh, but half of the classes they will be attending from their, their dorm room. Um, with all of these, uh, with all the upfront policy measures and 50% uh, remote classes, we estimate as an upper bound an R naught of 1.6 in the US Air Force Academy environment. Once you have an estimate for the R naught, uh, now you can come into the fizzle equation. So this is the fizzle equation. This is the R naught. These are test parameters. This is the duration of the illness. This is the test effectiveness. And then these are all the different test parameters and test ratios. So we think we'll be able to do between 10% and 20% effective contact tracing at the Air Force Academy. Now that may sound low, but this is a dormitory setting. It's a university setting with dormitory environment. And we just don't think, you know, we'll be able to identify who a cadet's roommate is and who they, you know, who their lab partner was in biology. Um, but we probably won't be able to identify who used the sink in the communal bathroom five minutes before they did. So, so 20% out of 20% effectiveness, uh, contact tracing effectiveness with an R naught of 1.6 and with the relatively conservative, uh, but again, consistent with what we've observed, 90% asymptomatic rate we would need to test at just over 2% every day in order to drain the infectious pool at a rate that reduces the R0 uh, effectively uh, to less than one. If you do that, so if you are filling up, if you are creating new infections at the same rate that you are draining them out of the pool of infections, the epidemic will fizzle. So just over 2% a day is where we get our 15% weekly estimate, re weekly requirement uh, for testing. Uh, this fan chart is our key result. So this is what fizzle looks like in practice. In the absence of any surveillance testing where you can only rely on a small percentage of symptomatic cadets showing up and whatever contacts you might be able to trace from them, this is what you might expect. So with a, an R0 of 1.6, uh, in, this, in this simulation, we're introducing a new randomly exposed, uh, new infectious individual every three weeks. Uh, we can expect uh, a median peak infection close to 100 with, uh, with extremes up to 133. And in almost all cases, uh, we actually get an outbreak. Uh, again, as defined, greater than 50 infections. Random testing, though, gives you a key signal. Uh, so in the absence of doing any testing, you're just flying blind, um, waiting for sick people to, to show up. But with random testing, we've now got a finger on our pulse. So this is what 15% ran random testing looks like. Uh, this is a fifth percentile. This is the 25th percentile run, 50th, 75th, and then the, the worst case, uh, 95th percentile run, all for the same conditions. Uh, what And you can see, we've gone from a, from a situation where we have a, a median infection around 100, and we've knocked that down to under 20. And in only 4% of the cases do we actually have what we would consider an outbreak at the Air Force Academy. Uh, so, so this is a, a key signal. 
uh, you don't at, at 15 percent testing, uh, we don't eradicate uh, the transmission. It, it might it might burble along at a very low level here, but you're catching it with that signal. Uh, there's another key attribute uh, and key contribution to, from doing this testing, particularly when you have a high asymptomatic rate. So let's consider a scenario where the R0 is not 1.6, as we supposed. Let's say that the R0 was actually 2.2. And then in addition, we have a super shutter event here in mid-October where a single person infects over 20 people. In the, if we weren't doing any testing, uh, this is what would happen. We could expect a median or the, the median peak infection is over 250 uh, with extremes in excess of 300. So we have no kidding, true outbreaks here. Uh, and in fact, in every single, in the, every single run, uh, we get an outbreak uh, under these scenarios. But with 15% weekly testing, in only three to four weeks, we now realize that we have a problem. Uh, our R0 is actually much greater. You can back out an estimate uh, based on the signal, that 15% signal that you're doing, uh, and you realize that your R0 is, is actually probably much greater than 1.6, and you can respond to that. In this case, the policy option, the response option, is that we triple the testing. We go from 15% weekly testing to 45% weekly testing uh, for the periods that are here in gray. And in only five to six weeks, we have knocked down that infection and actually kept it under control in, in all cases. So rather than an X, you know, 250 to 300 cases, uh, we still have a significant outbreak um, of, of close to 90, uh, but it is well controlled and we've not become the next uncontrolled Theodore Roosevelt. So the key point here is that random testing does a couple things. One, uh, if you've got all the estimates right, it, it helps you just keep keep the pop, keep uh, any type of uh, infection that might underlying infection going on at a very very low burble. Uh, in the event that you've got it wrong, though, uh, that that surveillance testing gives you a signal of what might be happening and gives you options to respond before it becomes too late uh, and to keep things again under control. We wouldn't be able to accomplish the level of testing that we plan to do if we didn't have the in-house world-class biology laboratory that we do. Uh, they've got the capability of using reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction to identify the specific RNA associated with SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Uh, the Department of Biology was also one of the first groups uh, that was able to really articulate the power of pooled testing. Uh, pull testing is essential to our testing strategy. Essentially, what we do is in each of these wells, uh, we can put eight to nine individual samples. And then in one pass through the thermocycler, uh, we're able to do 720 to 750 actual tests. And then if well, if well, three alpha here pops positive, well, then you still have leftover sample that you can send those off and you get to determine, well, which of the eight to nine individuals in that particular well was the was the positive sample and then put them into isolation. Uh, this pull testing is essential. It lets us achieve a level of testing, that 15% level of testing that we need to do. And it's also a very effective and efficient way of of, re, of minimizing the use of, of critical testing materials. Uh, so essentially you, you do 750 tests here, uh, but only using the reagents uh, that you would need through a single pass through the, uh, uh, the thermocycler here. Uh, so it's both efficient and a very, very good stewardship and use of limited test resources. So we're very excited to have all of our cadets back at the academy this fall, and we're certain that we'll be able to do so with the health and safety of our cadets, faculty, and staff as a top priority. Surveillance testing is, is going to be the key enabler that permits us to do so. Uh, the fizzle equation is, is, is underlies the, the level of surveillance testing that we're planning, and we're happy to share more details of the fizzle equation and its application to anyone who is facing similar challenges.